Our mission at SD Bullion is clear. The lowest cost gold and silver available online. While we do not have pretty blue boxes, free shipping, 4% credit card fees, or glamorous gold and silver infomercials, SD Bullion has the lowest prices that may save you hundreds on your next order. So before you make your next investment, do the math and join the over 15,000 new customers who have recently made the switch to SD Bullion. Why pay more? This is the Doc and Eric Dubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets Wrap. Well, Eric, uh, we've had a couple of weeks off for a vacation, but uh, the markets are back in action here uh, with a vengeance here in early 2016, particularly with all the focus on China in uh, the big market halt uh, to open the year here, uh, 2016. What's your take on uh, the early action here as we begin the new year? It's the stuff that's going on in China is just so fascinating to watch. I just learned today that they called their version of the plunge protection team the quote unquote the national team. <laughs> really provincial. But it, it, the sell off that we saw there is partly driven by realization that the Chinese economy is a lot weaker than the authorities and general public would both want. And uh, it, there was a rush as well to try to front run a rumor about the authorities. Uh, lifting the ban on the blocking of major stockholders from selling short. <laughs> and the, the rumor was that this was ban was going to be lifted on January 8th. So uh, the, you know, the market got away from the authorities that are managing the system overall, and they were aggressive last week, and they managed to you know, keep things together. And they, then we saw the sell-off yesterday, and today we were down about 3% out of the, out of the gate, and they dumped in 20 billion U.S. dollars worth of funds <laughs> and uh, got the market back up, but then, you know, it's, it's closed down. It was down about 3%. So uh, th- it, this is pretty concerning. I mean, uh, we have addressed the major theme about how, you know, the, the, the forward supply of both gold and silver are going to be curtailed enormously in the, the years ahead because of the kind of damage that the cartel has executed. We have the flip side in China of their slowing down economy, shellacking the entire commodity sector. And um, when you marry that with the trends that have been going on for the longest of time, you know, many, many years now with a dollar run, particularly in the last year and a half or so, uh, we've had this setup that has supported our, our precious metals bear market space move that we've been through. But I think that these kind of dynamics are going to mean revert. And the, the extent to which the dollar has moved has been massive. And uh, at some point, flight to safety in the form of gold is probably going to take place as people in the United States and we are, you know, Western markets uh, exit or are more cautious. Uh, periodically moving between both of those when it comes to their relationship to stocks and bonds. And that's going to be good for precious metals in 2016. <laughs> it's just the whole principle of mean reversion is such that we've had so much damage in the precious metal space. And it's really, it's very hard to imagine how we can't have a good year in 2016, but you know, we have to bite our tongue and bow our, uh, our respect to the cartel and their power. <laughs> they've made a fool out of market prognostications and more than we care to remember. <laughs> and I'd like to get your thoughts, Eric, uh, with everything going on in, in China and their uh, markets and meltdown mode. Ultimately, ultimately do you think they're going to have to uh, devalue the yuan? Uh, yeah, it's um, it's been something that they want to do uh, in part because of just the, to make their capital markets more accessible and uh, push export growth and, and that whole Keynesian philosophy about uh, export-led growth. And unfortunately, the beggar dynamic, uh, dynamic that comes afterwards. And we're in that. We're in kind of a currency war right now. Um, I mean, ultimately, in the long run, China's got a lot of positive attributes uh, and their economy is going to be solid. Uh, they've compressed about 70, 80 years of industrial growth into a decade. 
And the United States went through huge booms and busts when it was going through you know, its development, and it's normal to see countries do this kind of thing. So, I mean, I'm not a China bear in the long term, but 2016 is a real pickle because, uh, you know, their economy is definitely decelerating enormously. The, the authorities lie about their statistics, so probably just as bad as the United States. The United States is worse because you know, people actually believe the statistics. <laughs> um, so I, it, it's going to probably be a scenario where the commodity pressure is such that you know people in the, the conventional finance world you know, is going to continue to be bearish in commodities and pulling money out, and we still have the you know issues with Glencore and other companies that are massively exposed to derivative positions and, and unstable debt that they don't have the cash flow to support. So you know. In the first phase of 2016, it's likely that we're going to see continued pressure in the, the base metals in particular, and probably in oil. And it was interesting that oil was actually going down recently, uh, even though there's you know, elevating tensions in the Middle East in the last you know, week. But then, at some point, we're going to see the supply constraint kick in and have a shaping of the you know, stabilization of the process, of, excuse me, of the base metals. And, and probably the energy sector as well. So that, in general, is what I think will happen in 2016, um, where you get some stability in the in a broader commodity sector in the second half of the year, the, the latest, most likely. And it will also be associated with the dollar, um, no longer continuing its strong move that it's been on. It sounds like uh, what Jim Willie was saying uh, a year ago. <laughs> Well, no, not really. I mean, Jim Willie has been making a forecast consistently peppered uh, with different time uh, targets on you know the death of the dollar. And I don't think the dollar is going to go away. It's just going to have periods where it fades, uh, and then we may have a reset at some point in a couple of years. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, there are a couple of scenarios we've talked about them in previous shows, and to do justice to that subject right now, we probably have to do another 20 minutes, and we'll definitely cover that in weeks ahead you know, in future shows. Well, we're recording this week's show uh, early here on uh, Tuesday as the DAC's going to be headed down to Tampa for the second half of the week for the Florida United Numismatist Convention uh, down in Tampa. So if you're going to be in the Florida or Tampa area, stop on by... Uh, and we'll be down there uh, the second half of the week. So I wanted to give a, a quick update on what we're seeing in the physical markets here. Demand has been actually surprisingly strong for uh, both gold and silver here throughout the last couple of holiday weeks. Uh, typically, sales are down quite a, quite a bit as we get through the holidays as uh, traders go away and uh, for the the Christmas and New Year holidays, but uh, physical sales have been exceptionally strong. A lot of the authorized dealers are already selling on their anticipated third allocation of uh, the U.S. Mint for Silver Eagles in 2016. Really and essentially it's more like the seventh or eighth allocation because for the about six weeks the Mint takes off, they uh, stack up coins so they can um, release about four or five million into the market. Typically, historically speaking, uh, when they begin sales uh, mid-January and a lot of the uh, authorized purchasers from the Mint are already They've sold through their first and second allocations of what they anticipate the mint will produce. So demand stays extraordinarily strong, and that's keeping premiums elevated from historical norms, while yet they are backed off a, or eased up a bit from what we saw in Q3 when uh, Silver Eagle premiums jumped to about 5 to 6 bucks. Right now you're looking at about a, anywhere from uh, 3 to $4. Uh, I think we're running a, a at-cost special right now on the 16 Eagles, but across the, the industry you're looking at more about 3 to $4 right now on, on Silver Eagles. So up from historical norms, but still eased off a bit from what we saw in Q3. You know, I'm thinking about the conference and the, the convention and all of the different coin dealers and you know, people that come from the industry. You tend to have medium size and small folk uh, that make up the majority of the folk that probably come to these, and then the larger atmexes of the world, etc. I'm, I'm really curious, uh, what percentage of coin dealers you think out here really understand that the market for precious metals is manipulated? I mean, you know, the numismatic uh, folk tend to be, 
I don't know, I've been not quite as on the leading edge of uh, the political analysis, I guess is one way of putting it. <laughs> there, I don't know, I, I am overgeneralizing perhaps, but I'm curious, what, what has been your experience in terms of the knowledge and understanding that the people in the coin industry have when it comes to manipulation? What do you think? I mean, I think you're right. I don't think it's quite as bad as uh, the average mining executive and mining firm outside of maybe Keith Newmeyer. But I mean, it's not just the little guys and the little coin dealers. The, a lot of the authorized purchasers and the, the large U.S. distributors, um, I mean, you talk to them, they really don't sound too much different than a bank executive uh, as far as their general outlook on the the economy. Um, I mean, we, we've uh, mentioned in previous shows that a lot of the or several of the authorized purchasers uh, and wholesalers we've talked to and explained our hedging strategy that we hedge for uh, gold and silver ounces. Uh, they look at us like we're crazy. Why wouldn't you want to hedge for dollars and uh, make, <laughs> su- make sure your dollars are always hedged? In the, I mean, they're selling gold and silver coins. That's their business. And the thought or concept of wanting to make sure those uh, you keep that many ounces, whether the price goes up or down, uh, is completely foreign to them and they can't get over it. And you've never heard any other dealers speak about hedging ounces versus dollars, right? Well, I mean, we don't really uh, talk to many other dealers about uh, how they specifically hedge. But, I mean, as, as far as across the industry, no, that's not how the industry as a whole hedges. They, right, right, right. The industry as a whole hedges uh, for the dollar. And that's amazing because it shows the, the paradigm upon which people are operating, you know, the frame of reference. Exactly. All right, we're getting back to gold and silver here. Um, Eric, we were uh, chatting before the show here um, on Monday. Uh, silver really led, but both gold and silver spiked higher. They plateaued and held their gains for a couple of hours. And then uh, really in a, a classic smash down, um, gold was smashed back below before the beginning of the spike. Um, silver actually held a little bit stronger and recovered through the rest of the day, but uh, we were joking that uh, that chart pattern has become so familiar. We dubbed it the golden sombrero, that whenever you see uh, gold take a, a vertical spike of uh, 1 or 2%, you can really count on having that uh, pattern form up. And for any, yeah. we'll, we'll include a, um, a screenshot of the market charts for those who aren't familiar with it. But if you've been looking at gold and silver charts daily for the past uh, 5, 10, 15 years, you'll know exactly what we're talking about. Um, I, I mean, literally, I've probably seen this chart formation 50 times over the last few years. Yeah, and when it happens frequently, silver is uh, the metal that's being targeted to push both gold and silver down. And silver is a more thinly traded metal, and uh, so you know you're a, the cartels more able to be efficient about the manipulation. And yesterday, silver's uh, move downward in the right side of the slope of the sombrero <laughs> was uh, far more pronounced and and quick running of the stops, kind of an aggressive cartel attack. And uh, if you compare that, if you like layer the 72-hour uh, charts that Kiko produces, they're pretty handy when it comes to this type of uh, event because you can see the way in which uh, you know, it's a longer period of time over a 24-hour period as opposed to you know, candlesticks for you know, a single market where you know, you're trading on the comics hours or whatever. So, <clears throat> you know, it, it's it's amazing how frequently this happens. I mean, uh, we have that the golden sombrero formation, and then also the one percent and the two percent uh, capping rule that uh, James McShirley, a trader in uh, uh, Lund, uh, in uh, uh, lumber futures, uh, he works in the, in the construction industry, and he's been involved with lumber for <laughs> decades. Uh, and with this market experience, uh, and in discussions with GATA, he's been able to determine that you know anytime gold hits a one percent or a two percent level, that's where the capping comes in, and it's uh, uncanny in the percentage of times in which it happens uh, where the market will turn exactly at one percent or two <laughs> percent. These are algorithmically programmed capping systems, and uh, the frequency at which it happens in precious metals. Uh, exceeds that and all other commodities combined. I mean, it's a very strange behavior. And it's yet one of the additional things that, that people can point to that shows clear manipulation that the Securities and Exchange Commission and Commodities Futures Trading Commission and all those great regulators do nothing about. All right. Well, we'll wrap this week's show there. A bit of a, a light show as we uh, 
get on the buses and head down to Tampa for the FUN convention. So uh, we're hoping to do uh, a little bit of a write-up and take some photos and uh, get let the readers and listeners get a little bit of an inside show of one of the biggest uh, precious metals conferences in the year. If you're in the area, stop by and uh, say hello to us down in Tampa this weekend. And and definitely visit the Polish Mint if you're going uh, if they're going to be there. I don't know if they're attending, but uh, <laughs> I'd love to find out what's the story with those globe shaped uh, quote unquote coins and all the various other really innovative stuff that they're doing. Yeah, they're definitely pretty cool. All right, so we'll wrap up the show there. So for the Doc and Eric Dubin, thanks for tuning into this week's SD Weekly Metals and Markets.